Hello and welcome to ThinkPod, powered by the FII Institute. For more than 30 years, I led Sky News' coverage of global events, holding to account the politicians and changemakers shaping the world of today. In this series, filmed at the Sixth Future Investment Initiative in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, I've got the opportunity to question those shaping the future. At this inflection point in our history, how can we ensure that the future is one of prosperity and opportunity for all? This episode, we meet Fadi Gandur, managing partner at Wanda Capital, a platform that invests, nurtures, and builds entrepreneurship ecosystems across the Middle East. Not a single country in the world can produce everything, so we will continue to be in need of each other. As venture capital funding pours into the region, we learn about a new generation of trailblazers building its future. Well, thank you very much indeed for joining us on ThinkPod. I'd like to start by asking you to introduce yourself. Tell us about yourself. So my name is Vali Randur. I am uh, uh, an entrepreneur, if you want. I spent my life uh, building uh, a logistics company out of the region. I went global with it. It's called the IMX. We've started out of Jordan in New York uh, and then eventually became a deep pan uh, Arab uh, logistics and courier company. And then we went global to uh, over 90 countries, listed on NASDAQ, the first company from the region to list on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange in 1997. And has been listed now on the Dubai Stock Exchange. That's what I spent my life doing. And then eventually I retired in 2012. And I am now uh, uh, an early stage venture capital investor in the tech space across the Arab world. When we talk about logistics, couriering, that's what, delivering everything, basically, supplying everything. From a letter to uh, an engine and anything in between, globally. Was it easier or more difficult to do it in this region? Supremely more difficult. This is a difficult region. It was, was a much more difficult region. It's much easier now, obviously, but the business was launched in the 80s. So what can I tell you about the 80s? Infrastructure was different. The regulatory environment was very stifling. Communication was a challenge, foreign investment prohibitive. But that was also the opportunity, right? So when you have all these problems, then us uh, locals... That's what attracted you. Yeah. It eventually became uh, understood for me as, as the advantage early on, because a lot of our big competitors, other than DHL, which you know, were uh, shied away from this region because of its political challenges also, not only regulatory challenges. So there was, you know, the politics of the region. And so uh, we were able to build the business in calm times, if you want. Calm meaning from the business competitive uh, environment. We didn't have all these giants, UPS, Federal Express, all these guys were not in town at that time. So a local company, a regional company, uh, we were able to build the business uh, at, at a much lower capital requirement and slower, not under pressure to do you know, quick growth, quick uh, uh, having to raise too much money. We're the sons and daughters of the region, so we know it well and understood how to build it and how to be very patient to uh, overcome all these challenges. And has it got easier now? So much easier. I mean, all entrepreneurs are uh, have it easy now, in my view, because the region has normalized, I mean, normalized as in its regulatory space with the rest of the global uh, community. So foreign investment is so much easier. Now venture, means, venture funds are everywhere. The region is opening up to itself. So you can enter regional trade, enter regional movement. It's so much easier now. I mean, this is a different, I mean, this is the age of the internet, right? It's a digital age. You know, I, I was pre-internet, right? Yeah. So you, you and I are probably closer in age. So this, these were the days of the telex machine. I mean, in a sense, you made it easier and then your foreign competitors could come into the market once you Yeah, came. so they came in when we were already well established. So we love competition. They keep us very innovative and very creative. We don't mind competition at all. But the biggest challenge for us is to be able to stay relevant in our products and services. I mean, away from Ar Aramex, uh, you, yeah. you've concentrated more recently on, on social entrepreneurship. And that too, I mean, uh, yeah. along. I mean, this was in parallel. Sure. Right, so 17 years ago, we launched uh, a social impact organization called Ruad, 
Ruad in, uh, in English means entrepreneurs for development. So this is basically bringing in the private sector or the entrepreneurial community to be more socially engaged with marginalized communities across Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, uh, and, and the Palestine. So, so what, what sort of projects is, is that? So, so what we do at Ruad is we give uh, scholarships to university age uh, students in marginalized areas, less lucky areas, let's call them. Uh, in return, they give us four hours of volunteer work through a community center that we built. They go out with us and design programs around their four hour of volunteers, you know, volunteering uh, every week. You come and apply and we give you the scholarship. In return, you give us your time. So this is not, it's a, not a charitable organization. This is a mutual benefit organization. You have knowledge, you have capabilities. I want that knowledge and capability and I want to work with you to character build so that you feel you own your own solutions to the challenges that you have when you feel you are forgotten in marginalized communities. And so when governments are unable to solve your solution, your problems, then we basically work with them to make sure that they can go out and say, instead of complaining and finding solutions. And crucially, these people, the students you give scholarships to stay in their own communities rather than... Yeah, they stay and some of them, you know, a lot of them graduate, if you want to call it that, graduate meaning they go out, they find jobs, they become bread earners, and they, uh, they, they also give back to the community there. And they don't necessarily continue to live there, uh, but their families live there. They, they are very connected to that community. And so they'll always feel that the, they can continue to, to contribute to the development of that community. I mean, you, you talked us about technology. Right. How is technology changing education and the ability to train people? Massively. So, I mean, you know, the pandemic uh, reminded us uh, how important it is to uh, be digitally enabled in, in learning because, you know, when we were all stuck at home, uh, our kids uh, were, were having to learn uh, virtually. The tools you need to use are, are technological, but you need to also be uh, yourself technologically savvy. So this is a digital... Uh, uh, generations were digital first, uh, not like you and I. Yeah. Uh, we're not. We were analogs. The problem with the education system is that this young generation self learns because they're always online. Uh, it's the education system that needs to catch up to this digital first uh, generation. Do you feel that in this region there is the infrastructure necessary? Completely. Yeah. This region is, is first world and it's, and, and it's broadband. It might be a bit expensive in, in some areas, but and then that's, that's an issue that needs to be discussed in terms of are we going to say that it is a right, just like you have electricity and sure. you have water, is it a right that you are going to be digitally connected at a reasonably accept, acceptable cost for all communities and not only for the well-to-do? That's a big question. The infrastructure is there. The cost, that is the question. Because so there is reach. There is no community that doesn't get connected. Yeah, but data, but at is, what cost? data is expensive here compared to yeah, India, for example. Yeah, it's different. It's different, you know, but it is much better than it was ever before. So there is a competitive environment. There are multiple uh, service providers. We need to think much more deeply about how to actually have universal access at reasonable costs. It's a global issue, not only a Middle East issue sure. or an Arab issue. Uh, and, and the region is, is aware of it. There is certainly a movement towards making it much more affordable. And that could be one of the beneficial side effects of the pandemic. Completely. You know, it woke up governments also. Because when governments tell the students, most of the schooling system in the Arab world is government run. And so when the government tells people you need to go and access your classroom virtually, you're basically telling the students you need to be online, right? So you either provide them the online because that's an extra cost to families that can't afford it. You, I mean, that's what you have to do. You either give a subsidy for it mm -hmm. or you make it available at no cost because the student should not be bearing the cost uh, in a government school of being online. You've also uh, co-founded Al Riyadi. Charity. Basketball club. Yeah, why? I'm passionate about basketball. And, uh, I, you know, in, in Aramex, the company that I founded, we, we've had felt all through the years that 
we are an organization that needs to be engaged with, with society in general. And so we did Ruad in marginalized areas. And when we did the Riyadh before the Ruad, the Riyadh is 35 years old now, the, the, the basketball club. Uh, we felt that working with youth, young kids through sports, it's all not for profit, uh, is, is a way to, uh, for us to, one, brand build, and number two, doing it through sports, this becomes uh, a way of contributing to, to health, to teamwork. Yeah. You know, everything that you, you preach as an organization is reflected in a, in a sports club. But it's effectively become a sort of gym network, is it? Or? Fantastic, because you have the parents also engaged with you. Because, uh, you know, we, we worked with age groups from six years old all the way to, to national, uh, national basketball teams. So we, are, we reintroduced basketball in, in Jordan uh, for women. Uh, in, in clubs, again, it's, it's participating in the community socially rather than only being uh, a business for profit. So we are a business that felt that the business of business is not only business. We affect the community positively or negatively in what we do. So we took initiatives to be a positive contributor to the community beyond us selling products and services. I mean, I get the sense that you feel that the solutions to society must be homegrown, the kind of... Completely. Uh, and the investment as well. Uh, totally. Preferably, yeah. Tot I mean, nobody knows the communities uh, than yeah. the people that live in them. Yeah. We don't want parachuting solutions from, from an outside world. Uh, the community has capabilities, has knowledge. And that's why in Ruad we said, you know, the private sector has money, has knowledge, has networks, has access. You don't need to wait for foreign aid to solve your problems. You can all solve your own problems in your own communities so that you have a society that is stable. And thinking about the well-being of society is not for the well-to-do only. Sure. It is for everyone in the society and, and the private sector and the entrepreneurial community have a duty to be part and parcel of the solution, not only leave it to government and say, this is the government's job. It's not our job. Our job is to maximize profit. But that's an old formula that is defunct because we know when the private sector uh, uh, misbehaves, it affects so many people in, in, uh, globally. So, I mean, financial crisis is, is a well-given uh, uh, example of uh, 2008, 2009, when a failure of a bank in New York affected us all globally, right? So we need to be very conscious of how, what, how we conduct ourselves in, in, in the communities that we live in as a private sector. And do you think the consequences of that is that sort of deglobalization is a good idea? No, I'm, I'm a globalizer. Uh, I, yeah. I don't think there is, you know, I think deglobalization is, is talked about more in, in newspapers than the reality. The, the world is, is, is global. Uh, trade yeah. continues to happen. If there is tension between the Chinese and the Americans on trade, it doesn't mean there is deglobalization. There is more to the world than only two or three countries. I appreciate their size. I appreciate that China is the second biggest economy and the US is the first biggest economy. <laughs> there are 180 countries around the world that continue to trade with each other. So, uh, and we don't want to take uh, the f challenge of, of competitiveness among nations as deglobalizing. There is certainly a reintroduction to the way they want to do business, right? So you don't want to outsource certain strategic industries to be manufactured in China, and you want to repatriate th those in mm. industries back to, to home countries. But that doesn't mean it's deglobalizing. It only means there is a, a, a reprioritizing in certain countries of how they want to conduct mm. their strategic uh, uh, industries. But the world continues to be open for trade because not a single country in the world can produce everything. So we will continue to be in need of each other. But how do you feel or how would you like the United States and Europe to adjust their approach to the region? Well, I'd like them to think of the region that we are not the old region that was dependent on them for security and for trade and for innovation and for uh, imports and for products. Uh, we are a region of very young people, uh, very ambitious people. Uh, we are a relatively uh, uh, highly educated region. And there is a, a whole new generation here of our leaders and our uh, uh, rising young population who feel that they want to build uh, new businesses. They want to build solutions for our own, uh, our own challenges. And they, you need to look at us as such, uh, you know, being a bit independent and being a bit uh, more mature about uh, who we are as countries because we are mostly very young countries here. 
uh, is not a challenge to the West. I think it's, it's, uh, it should give the West comfort that this region is confident uh, and, and sure of itself uh, and wants to be treated on, a, on an equal basis rather than being, uh, you know, what we were historically subordinated to the West. I mean, you, you said to me that investment uh, sources are springing up all over the place. Completely. Where is that money coming from? Sovereign wealth funds. Uh, you know, look, this, is, this region, so I say sovereign wealth funds because these are the tools. This region is still oil dependent. And you know where the oil price is today. There is uh, a new wealth coming because of that. And because of the, dev the, the new development thinking of the young generation and new leaders in this region, there is, uh, as you can see from Vision 2030 and Vision 2050 in, uh, in, in the Emirates and other countries, there is a view uh, to develop the economies beyond oil. So they want to use the oil income today so that they can build an economy that when oil is no longer around. If you look around you here in Riyadh, I mean, the change that has happened in the past five years and the plans they have for the next 10 years, it's like mind boggling. If you had visited this region in the 70s and 80s and, and are visiting today, you will, you will see the incredible seeds of rapid change. And, and finally, what about you? What are your ambitions for the next decade? Um, you know, I continue to do, um, uh, I love what I do. I love this region. I continue to feel that uh, this is a region that has tremendous uh, potential. Every, every decade, I feel where, where I feel that, you know, we've reached uh, a place uh, that uh, I'm satisfied with, and then suddenly I find all sorts of new opportunities. I'm thinking of it as like we're, we're, we're at, a, at the first mile of a long journey. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Adiganda, thank you very much. Thank you so much. In these turbulent times, don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe to ThinkPod for more insight and analysis.